Hello and welcome to everyone who is joining us from across Scotland and across the UK for this webinar, which will focus on three issues really, on uh, employment issues, on housing and on the question of settled status. Um, I'm Ronnie Convery, I'm the Honorary Consul in Glasgow and I wanted to thank uh, the organisations who have made this event possible very quickly and that would be the, the Consulate General in Edinburgh and uh, the Consul is here and we'll speak to us shortly. Uh, the Comites, which is, as you know, the organisation that is recognised by the Italian government as representing the interests of the Italian community here and the President of the Comites, Adriano De Marco, will say a few words and also the Chamber of Commerce, which is always so active uh, Scottish representative da David Ibarnia has been very uh, supportive in setting this whole thing up and he will also say a few words. Um, just a few uh, brief announcements. We start now, we will finish at 6.30 on the dot, we won't go on any longer than that. Um, the, the guests will speak for a little bit and you have the opportunity to uh, ask questions. The questions are not live, so if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a little Q and A box. And if you open that, then you can type your questions. I will follow those questions and put the questions to the speakers. Okay, so that's the idea of how we, we run the, the webinar. I don't want to say any more, time is short. So I would uh, now like to hand over to the Consul General of Italy for Scotland and Northern Ireland, Fabio Monaco, to say a few words. Fabio. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much and good afternoon to you all. Uh, thank you for the enthusiastic participation in this webinar that I hope will be followed by others. The Italian Consulate, together with the other Italian institutions in Scotland and Northern Ireland, has been trying to help our national to cope with the problems related to the COVID-19 since uh, the beginning of the emergency. And uh, obviously, the first effort was to help those who wanted to repatriate. But now we want to support those who live here by informing them about the measures put in place by the British authorities. Let me thank all the speakers who have joined us today and uh, of course, all other partners who made this possible. On my part, I must urge you not to forget the EU Settlement Status Scheme. Please keep sending your application without delay. We were working on it closely with the local government before March, but obviously we had to stop due to the emergency. But we will soon recommend this cooperation in order to support all of you and your family. I'm sorry I won't be able to uh, stay with you until the end of uh, the webinar because I have another call with London, but I'm sure I'm leaving you in good hands. Thanks again and best wishes to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you, Consul. So I now, I now wanted to ask Adriano De Marco Cavalieri, Adriano De Marco, who is the president of the Comites, just to say a few words of welcome. Hello, you can hear me? Yeah. We can. Yeah. Um, just so I want to say hello and thanks to everybody who's taken part tonight. This idea came about because we were thinking the best way to contact everybody or to to get at least a view from our community in Scotland and Northern Ireland and if we could help them anyway then we're quite happy to do that. Um, again I hope it'll be a good night and we'll, we'll get a good reaction from the community. The COVID is obviously is always available for any help or information and uh, I would like to thank all the speakers but also Ronnie that is going to be the main the chairman of the meeting and in particular David Varga because he's really done a lot of work a lot of research to make this 
uh, an event that hopefully is helpful for everybody and I wish everybody well and keep safe. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Adriano. Um, we now pass to Davide, who you've just heard about, Davide Barnier from the Chamber of Commerce, who is uh, the man with the, his finger on the button of this event. Uh, so, Davide, if you want to say a few words. Thanks, Ronnie. Thank you very much, you all. Um, I don't want to take too much time away from the panelists, so I would like just to remind you all that the Italian Chamber of Commerce in Scotland is here to support any Italian companies or entrepreneur interested in doing business in Scotland. Um, we do that through different activities like events, conferences, missions between Italy and Scotland, fairs. Um, of course, at the moment, a number of our activities are um, reduced because of the um, coronavirus emergency, but we are still here to support whoever needs our help with consultancy and trying to understand what sort of support the government could give them. And, and disseminating information through different webinars like this one. So thank you very much. We are very happy as Chamber of Commerce to support both the committees and the consulate in doing this. So um, I hope you find it helpful. And yeah, back to you, Ronnie. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for that, Davide. So introductions over in record quick time. That was only six minutes, which is good. Um, a reminder, to the, oh, I think we're about 70 participants plus the speakers. Um, if you have a question uh, at the bottom of the screen where it says Q&A, click on that and type your question and I will put it to our speakers. So time for the first speaker, Maurizio Rodrigo from Inca UK, uh, who has gently, very kindly agreed to join us and talk to us about the employment issues, obviously a serious concern for many members of the community here who may be affected by um, the furloughing process or redundancy or access to uh, unemployment benefit and so on. So many questions I'm sure, but Maurizio, if you want to speak uh, initially just to give us a, an overview of the situation. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. And uh, thank you for uh, to Comites, the Italian Consulate and the uh, Italian uh, Chambers of Commerce uh, for organizing this. Um, I will uh, talk uh, briefly about uh, three uh, things that I want to share with you. And then if there will be questions after, after my, my speech, uh, I'm happy to, to, to answer your questions. So the three things that I would like to talk about would be uh, the two schemes uh, put in place by the British government to support um, workers and self-employed persons during this crisis. And the third thing would be the universal credit, which is a, a, benefit, a, bene um, a welfare benefit that existed before this crisis, but has been hugely um, um, claimed during this uh, period. So we'll talk about the coronavi coronavirus uh, job retention scheme for the employed, the um, self-employment income support scheme for the self-employed and the uh, uh, universal credit. Of course, when I, when I mention employed and self-employed pe people, I'm also talking about people who have lost, who are no longer employed or self-employed. So after the, um, lock when the lockdown started, the first scheme that was launched by the Chancellor was the um, uh, uh, job retention scheme. So for everyone who was employed by a company before uh, the 19th of March, so soon after the lockdown, uh, the government has said that um, in order for companies to retain um, uh, the, the most, um, most workers, let's say even all of them if they wanted to, the government would uh, uh, fund the 80% of their salary. So that's why now you're uh, hearing about uh, furlough workers. So furlough means a temporary absence of leave from work. So would, in Italian would be casa integrazione. Uh, so means that someone would be, uh, would stay at home basically and not work for their company, but they would still receive 80% of the salary funded by the government. And actually the company might even top up that and pay them the full salary, like 100%. Um, this must be agreed between the employer and the, the employee. And of course, the alternate most empl employee would accept that because uh, the alternative would be a redundancy, so a dismissal by redundancy. 
Um, so this means that there will be an F a written agreement. I guess some of our um, audience to tonight will probably be on furlough. And um, the minimum um, time for the furlough is three weeks, but it can be extended. Uh, for example, the beginning of this scheme was supposed to last three months, but it's been extended up to October for now. Um, the 80% of the salary also includes tax, national insurance contributions, and even uh, employers' um, per complementary pension. Then for the self-employed, because of course when this scheme was launched, there were some, the trade unions uh, uh, were complaining about, uh, uh, about there was no similar scheme for the self-employed. So the chancellor came up with the second scheme for the self-employed, um, which, which tries to mirror the scheme for the, empl the employees. That's why you will have the, the self-employment income support scheme will also uh, provide um, 80 per, uh, provide for 80 percent of the um, um, of the average profit. In this case, we we don't talk about salary, but we call about uh, the profit that self-employed people were were making from their trade. Um, and how is this calculated? This is calculated uh, um, taking into account the average um, profit that self-employed people were making during the previous. Uh, three tax years. So this applies only to people that were al already trading. So not new, not to uh, newly self-employed people. Uh, they have been left out of this scheme. You must have uh, um, submitted at least one tax uh, self-assessment tax return during uh, the the last tax year or one of the last three tax years at least. The difference with the, with, the, with the other scheme for the employees is that um, self-employed people will take advantage of this scheme and they can get up to um, 2,500 pounds per month uh, for three months. This is the same limit for, employ, uh, for the employees. The limit is 2,500 per month. Uh, but self-employed people can also continue working. Even if they take advantage of this scheme, they can continue working. Whereas people on furlough, they might also be able to take extra work while, whilst they're on furlough, but they must check uh, they must check that with their employers because their contract might might not allow that. So as um, we were saying, for the for the um, employee people, the um, the offer is um, they will be offered the, the furlough scheme by their employers. Whereas for the self-employed people would be the HMRC contacting them, basically the government contacting them and telling that uh, they are eligible and then they will need to apply online. Actually, the, the online application started yesterday and it was on the news because it was, of course there was a huge number of applications. For people who have been left out by both schemes, but also for people who, who, uh, who have been uh, affected by this by those scheme but their salary is not high enough to to allow them a decent life let's say according to the british government there is the universal credit which is a um welfare benefits that has been in place for some years now and that as the name suggests replaces several different previous benefits uh, universal credit will take into account uh, a person's um, income uh, and also uh, uh, costs, outgoings, let's say, like what, what you spend for um, rent for your children if you have a disability that, that prevents you from working. So uh, universal credit, credit applications went up um, from 100,000 per month to 1 million a month uh, during the lockdown. Now there, there have been, since the start of the lockdown, there, there have been one one million and eight hundred thousand applications so of course this has caused problems to the to the system because it's all done online you will people will need to uh, first um, pass an habitual residence test which is a, a test that only applies to um, when a, when a person claims a, a welfare benefits in the uk and then we will see the, the connections with the settled status uh, scheme and then uh, people will be asked to input uh, their details like income, uh, savings, um, rent, uh, details um, uh, from their landlords and employers. And then um, there will be a, a commitment um, that 
claimants will have to accept. Usually it would be an, a commitment to, to attend interviews at the job center, but of course during the lockdown all um, appointments at job centers have, have been suspended. And then the first payment, if the, if the claim is accepted, the first payment will be received after five weeks. So it's very important to apply early, as early as possible because we also we've seen at my um, organization, we've seen many people telling us that they were waiting to apply because they wanted to check with their employers if they would be put on the on furlough or if they would get a grant uh, as a self-employed person. But we, al we always recommend people to apply because you always have the time to amend your, your application later on because the universal credit is a work in progress benefit. So you will have an account online where you can up update your, your details such as income or um, rent, for example. And um, many, we've seen so many applications rejected because of um, the failing the habitual residence test. So we can talk about this uh, uh, soon after my speech. Actually, I'm done with my intervention, so I'm, I'm happy to, to, to take questions. Thank you. Okay, so thank you to Maurizio for setting out the, the main um, opportunities, if you like, for people to seek help during this particular period of uh, emergency. Um, just to remind everyone that if you have a question, uh, go to the bottom of the screen and you will see there some, some buttons, participants and Q&A. And if you open that Q&A button, then you can type a question as Giovanni has just done. Um, I'm glad to say the question there is, uh, what do they define as the habitual residency? So that would be if someone is claiming uh, benefits, what do they have to do to, to uh, have uh, their claim settled on the basis of habitual residency? Um, there are some other questions which have come in, which I'll just go through and uh, uh, Maurizio, you can maybe take a note of them and then respond. Um, Someone asks, for example, if it's true that the coronavirus retention scheme, uh, the furloughing, in other words, will be reduced to 60% of salary a little bit uh, down the road. It's currently 80%. So yeah. is it true that that will be reduced? Um, and the third question which has come up is relating to a situation where if uh, uh, an employer makes a person redundant if they're fired, um, could they still be uh, eligible for the, for the scheme, for the, the furlough scheme? So um, there are some questions for, for Maritza to be going on with. One more and then we'll stop and let Maritza respond. And that one is from Diana who asks, if someone is selected now for statutory help for the self-employed, but has already applied for the other kinds of credit, will they get both or do they have to renounce one in order to take up the other? Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay. over to Maurizio. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Consul. Uh, so the, for the first question, which is very important, uh, I'm glad it came up. So about the habitual residence test is the most important uh, obstacle, first obstacle to a uh, universal credit applications. So regarding residency, this is a question, that is a test that applies only when someone claims a benefit. We know that in now about residency for European citizens in the UK, there is the EU settlement scheme. So anyone who has applied and has got the settled status, so more than five, year, five years residence, will automatically pass this habitual residence test during a universal credit application. So it will skip, we will pass this test. Whereas every, every other person, so people who, with pre-settled status, won't skip this test. And there is actually some, some organizations are challenging this, but this is the, the position of the UK government. This is because um, they want, the um, British government want to see uh, that the per, want, if the person that applies uh, for the benefit is a qualified person, say qualified is, uh, comes from European uh, legislation, so it was pre-Brexit, um, but it was a, this was an obstacle which was um, added uh, maybe 10 years ago and was all part of the hostile environment. So let's say 
um, they want to see that the person who's claiming a benefit uh, has been working or doing a qualifying activity before claiming the benefit. So what I can say is that everyone who's been working up, up until just before the lockdown would be a qualified person because they can, of course, they need to demonstrate because we also see we have problem with people working cash in hand, for example, without a contract. That's a bit more tricky, but still can be uh, demonstrated that they were working. Also, a self-employed person would be the same. Even a, so, a person who's a job seeker, which means um, unemployed, if a person qualifies themselves as unemployed, they would fail the habitual residence test. Um, in order, that's what we record. That's why it's important to do applications with some, being helped by someone who, who knows what they're doing. Um, because when you apply and you're not working, you don't have to say that you're unemployed. You have to say that you're a job seeker, and you should uh, prove that you're a job seeker. Like you apply to, the, uh, you register with the job center, you apply for job seekers allowance. Because in that case, it means that you. You kind of you are retaining your worker status. You you you've lost your previous job, but you're still looking for another one. It's not that you went uh, uh, to sleep every day and uh, drink margaritas. You are still looking for a job. So that's very important. And probably there would be some people who've been who've seen their applications rejected because of the habitual residence test. Unfortunately, regarding the sixty percent. The, mm, the reduction of the coronavirus uh, job uh, retention scheme to 60 percent. I have heard of it. I mean, we know that the, the scheme has been extended. The official position for now is that the scheme has been uh, extended until October. I haven't. I'm not sure about that. It's been confirmed the reduction of it. But of course, if this scheme should be extended, it's even a proposal of the trade unions. To, uh, to convince that this is a lot of money that the government is spending for all of these schemes, of course, in these extraordinary times. So, of course, if they, they, uh, the scheme uh, were to continue, it's a, it's, um, we can assume that it will be reduced. They won't be able to pay forever 80%. But I'm not sure about if this will apply uh, already from June. I, don't, I think it will still be 80% for some time. I, I can, we can we can get in touch about this later on. About redundancy, so a person who's been made redundant cannot, cannot, be, um, cannot take advantage of the uh, job retention scheme, of course, because this is only for people who are on the payroll of the company. The government has allowed uh, um, companies to re-employ someone who had been um, made redundant, redundant soon after the lockdown. In fact, they allowed uh, companies to re-employ so that they can, they could, those workers could then um, take advantage of the job retention scheme. But this decision is totally uh, down to the companies. Uh, it's, I mean, the companies don't have to uh, um, follow uh, their employees. It, this is an offer from the government that they could take advantage of this offer. But unfortunately, I mean, some companies We've seen companies that have um, uh, kept some workers and not others. And uh, okay. <clears throat> if there is a discrimination there, it's only um, people could only try to to check this with with their own trade union. We recommend every worker to join a trade union. Sure. Maurizio, I'm very conscious of time, so yeah, just ask, can I just ask you very quickly to answer, you know, in a few words, the the, the following questions. Um, uh, is it legal to be made redundant even if the employer put the employee on the furlough scheme? So yes or no? <laughs> you can either um, be made redundant or on the on, or, or on furlough. You cannot be both. If you're redundant, you cannot be on furlough. Okay. If a person's contract ends at the end of June and the person is in furlough, furlough um, can that contract be renewed and the person remain on furlough? Okay, that's very interesting. Uh, that's up to the to, at the end of the first furlough. They, as I said before, that there was a written agreement. If when this period of furlough, which minimum was three weeks, uh, when this ends, the company might dismiss the the employee, like uh, made made them redundant, or or propose they offer them another uh, period of furlough, which actually is funded by the government, by down to the company. Okay, and the, and the last one, and then we move on. Um, quite a heartrending uh, question here. I, 
person had to take a, a lifestyle break from work, working in, uh, in Tesco, frontline in Tesco, um, the company doesn't have a plan to support employees who are concerned about their life because they're key workers and is now without any income. Is there any chance to be eligible for some financial support? Of course, uh, universal credit would be the the, the most. Yeah. So you should apply for universal credit. Yes, okay. yes. That's great. But I, I would be surprised that Tesco wouldn't be. I mean, it's. I I, I see. I, I've seen them putting in place uh, measures for their employees. So. Okay. Okay. There are lots of questions, as you can imagine, on these issues. Um, I'm sure Maurizio, you would be glad to to answer questions if people had personal issues. I would stay in touch with yeah. you. Uh, yeah, at Inca so. and, uh, and, and you could respond to them there. Let's move on. We want to stick to time. Um, and I'm delighted that we have with us Mark Lazarevich, who is from the Citizens' Rights Project. Um, Mark has a distinguished background as a, a politician. He was a, a member of parliament uh, and now is working very hard using his legal skills to help EU citizens with housing issues. So Mark, if I could just ask you to say a few words about that particular area of concern. Well, thank you very much. Uh, as you will see, my topic is housing rights in Scotland during the coronavirus crisis. And you explained uh, uh, my background, Ronnie. So I will move on to the next slide. Right. Uh, what uh, I'm going to do in this presentation is first of all uh, talk about the special arrangements that have been put in place in Scotland which have been designed to give greater housing rights during the coronavirus period. So I'm not going to talk about the existing rights but what is additional. Um, I'm going to be concentrating on the rights given to tenants but I'll also say something about the position of landlords and I will also say a little bit about assistance uh, that might be available for homeowners as well. Now just uh, to uh, uh, ex explain that the residential tenancies, that's tenants who occupy uh, 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 houses obviously, um, are found in different types of tenancy arrangement, different types of legislation applies. Uh, but broadly speaking, the additional rights which have been given by the Scottish Parliament to tenants are in broad terms the same across all the different types of tenancies. But there are some differences between each type of tenancy and the added rights the tenants have got. So if you are involved in a problem with your tenancy, it's important you check exactly which tenancy you have because the rights could be different. But in broad terms, there are two additional rights that have been given to uh, tenants. First of all, the period of notice for eviction has been extended. That is the period that a landlord has to give to a tenant, uh, the period of notice before a landlord can then uh, seek to get that tenant uh, removed by a court order. In most cases, that period of notice has been extended to six months. But in some cases, it can be for a shorter period. The details vary for different tenancy types. But for example, if your landlord is trying to remove you because uh, he or she says you're being antisocial, then it's a shorter period than if it's a question of rent arrears. So that's one change. And the second additional change, that's additional power that's been given to, uh, or uh, change which has been uh, agreed by the Scottish Parliament, which will benefit tenants, is that tribunals and courts uh, must now in all cases almost all cases exercise discretion when they're being asked by a landlord to evict somebody they have to now consider is it reasonable to grant eviction so even if a landlord has proved his case proved that you owe rent arrears or that you've been an antisocial tenant then the court also has to ask themselves uh, is it reasonable to grant the uh, eviction? And that's an important difference because in the past, or rather in the normal legislation, there are some cases, most obviously rent arrears, where if a landlord proves the case, then in some types of tenancy, the court uh, has to grant an order to evict you and has no discretion whether or not to do so. Now, in almost all cases, the court will have to, the tribunal in some cases, will have to decide, is it reasonable to grant eviction? And clearly, 
one of the things that well, the most important thing will be is that given the COVID circumstances, is it reasonable to go into eviction because perhaps a tenant has got no money or whatever? So that's an important uh, protection for a tenant. And those are the two most important uh, changes in Scotland. I should say, by the way, because I know there are some people watching this from outside Scotland, uh, housing law is one of those areas where the legislation is quite different from that in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. So I'm talking about the situation in Scotland. There are some similar arrangements, I believe, but I'm not a lawyer in England, uh, which do apply in England and elsewhere, but I'm just talking here about Scottish law. So if you're from England and want to look into this, you will need to get advice from someone who's qualified uh, in that area. So those are the two main changes, extra rights which should be given to tenants in Scotland during this uh, period. But there were also some other uh, rights. But before I do that, I just want to say something. I, I've forgotten this slide about the legislation, where it comes from. It's always useful if you want to find where uh, the law comes from to have the details. The changes to the law, the temporary changes, are in this Act of the Scottish Parliament, the Coronavirus Scotland Act 2020. Shed, uh, section 2 and Schedule 1 in particular, and these new rules on eviction apply where a landlord serves a notice on a tenant on or after the 7th of April 2020. So if you had a notice served on you before then, then the existing standard rules apply. These new changes in the eviction rules are temporary. They're due to expire on the 30th September 2020, but the period can be extended or uh, ended earlier. And one point to emphasise is that although because of these changes tenants have no more rights and the courts or tribunals don't automatically evict somebody in some cases, eviction is still possible. There's no moratorium, no ban on evictions. It may take longer for a landlord to go to court, but at the end of the day, if he or she can show there's a, a reasonable case for you to be removed, then the court will still grant that. I should say that there's a second coronavirus bill going to be going to the Scottish Parliament next week, well it started a process just now, and that may also give some extra rights to uh, tenants uh, as well. Now the main change was uh, to, which, uh, which um, has been introduced to benefit uh, tenants, has been to the rules on eviction. There was also one other change which I should mention as well. The Scottish Government has also changed the rules on unsuitable temporary accommodation. And all homeless applicants are now entitled to suitable, and there's a definition within the law of what, it, what that means, suitable temporary accommodation within seven days, in some cases immediately. Uh, and this is a permanent change, not just temporary. It's been brought into effect now because the Scottish Government was going to do it anyway and thought it'd be a good thing to do at this period because obviously many people who are homeless will be in a very difficult position if they don't get housing uh, uh, from the local authority. So the main changes then to benefit tenants have been the rules on evictions and in the case of those who are seeking homeless accommodation from a, from a council, the extension of the right to have suitable temporary accommodation. But I want to say something very briefly about landlords as well, because obviously when tenants get more rights, that is quite often inevitably having an impact on the landlord whose uh, rights are therefore affected to, uh, uh, in, in the other direction. Uh, landlords may qualify for general business assistance, uh, which has been offered by the UK and Scottish governments. In addition, there's a scheme in Scotland, which has been offered to private landlords. This offers certain private landlords up to 100% of the lost rental income for a single property. As you will see, it's aimed at private rent set of landlords who are not classified as businesses, but five less properties to rent and have lost rental income due to tenants unable to pay rent as a result of a pandemic. So it won't uh, benefit all landlords, but it's something which the smaller landlord might be able to benefit from uh, if uh, they fall within the uh, qualifying categories. Something about homeowners, because obviously many people who are facing problems in their housing uh, uh, during this crisis will be homeowners. Um, there was a general agreement by the mortgage lenders to promise payment holidays of up to three months where this is needed because of hardship related to a coronavirus. It's also possible that if a homeowner was in arrears because of 
coronavirus and were facing loss of their house. There were some items of legislation in Scotland which do require a court to decide whether or not it is reasonable in the circumstances to allow the house to be repossessed. Obviously no one's tested this particular provision when it comes to people who are facing arrears because of coronavirus, but it's something which might be of benefit for somebody who's in that situation. To conclude, the new rules on evictions will certainly help many tenants and courts and tribunals are very likely to be sympathetic to tenants who get into problems because of coronavirus and even to those uh, whose problems are to do with things uh, such as uh, uh, acting in an antisocial manner. Courts and tribunals may still be more reluctant to evict somebody where they know that person might not be able to be housed elsewhere. But it's important to emphasise that tenants still have obligations to landlords. Nobody is going to be getting away with paying, we're never paying the rent forever. Uh, and people should understand that there are, the measures will delay uh, action being taken. And that is why I emphasise as a final point before I come to some closing uh, comments, that if people do have financial problems, leading to problems of arrears, then they should get a financial assistance, they should get advice, and recommend to tenants who are in problems, talk to the landlord, and to a tenant to landlords, talk to tenants, talk to your bank and lender if you're a tenant in problems, because quite often these uh, problems could be resolved by discussion with the uh, landlord or with your bank, rather than requiring yourself to use legal uh, measures to uh, deal with those problems. And finally, some useful links. The first link is to the Scottish Government's publication, which is on uh, FAQs for landlords and letting agents, but I mention it because in fact, it also includes details and links to the rights that tenants have. It also includes details and links to some of the benefits um, which people can get, which uh, uh, we were just hearing about. If you have a problem with facing eviction, uh, a website I would always recommend is the Shelter Scotland website who do provide very effective advice online. There's also a version for Shelter England and Northern Ireland as well. And finally, here is the link to the Citizens Rights Project where we have information on a number of matters of benefit uh, to residents in Scotland, to uh, EU citizens, which uh, again, I would recommend to you. And that is again, multilingual, it includes some Italian pages as well. So that's all I have to say at this stage, obviously happy to answer any questions, which uh, there may be. Mark, thank you very much for that. Um, as you can imagine, people have been asking questions as you speak, but as far as I can see, you have answered the questions in your in your presentation. So for example, someone asked, can I offer to defer if I can't pay at the moment? And I think your answer was yes, speak to the landlord and try and come to some arrangement. Someone asked about, can I be kicked out if I lose job? And again, you, you answered that in a way by saying that uh, this new reasonableness test uh, has come in. Uh, and someone asked about any government support for landlords who are not getting rent. And again, I think you, you covered that. Um, I suppose the ultimate fear of people is homelessness, that they could be thrown out of their house and they would have be in the nightmare scenario of having nowhere to stay here if they were an Italian citizen and be unable to get home. Um, at the end of your presentation, you talked about Shelter being an organisation that you would always go to. Um, would that be your first port of call for someone in that position? It's a, it's a very good website to... Uh... Uh, to, uh, to go to. I think that uh, there are various other advice agencies out there as well. One reason I put out the Citizens' Rights Project addresses that we also have various source information which we can uh, point you to various other agencies throughout the country. Shelter Scotland is the most obvious one to go to, but there are agencies, law centres, uh, citizens' advice as well who can provide uh, information support of various types. Can I just answer or say a bit more about the question about somebody wanted to offer uh, uh, money to the landlord. That's a, uh, something which someone can do uh, and if a landlord isn't uh, going to, isn't sympathetic, then again if matter, if matter does go to court then you, you or your lawyer can always offer to make payments towards the arrears payment of a longer period. It's up to the court to decide whether or not 
uh, or in most cases, most cases of private tenancy, there'll be a tribunal in Scotland. It's up to a court of tribunal to decide whether or not to accept your offer. But I think people will, will find that during the current crisis, I think tribunals and courts will be sympathetic. Uh, and uh, I think that the intention behind the Scottish government's legislation is clearly to try and make sure that nobody loses their home unless there's absolutely no alternative or, for example, antisocial behaviour that they you know, have to remove the benefit of other neighbours as well. But I, I think if people have a reasonable case, then I think courts are likely to be very sympathetic. Okay. Thanks very much for that, Mark. I'm just conscious of the time and we are sticking to time very well. Um, already we have two questions for our next speaker before he's even spoken, which uh, well, actually there's a bad. lot. <laughs> <laughs> quite, a few, quite a few questions will be flying yeah, around. So, so, so Dimitri uh, Scarlato is from the yeah. 3 million uh, organisation uh, who are trying to help EU citizens uh, facing with the consequences of Brexit and he's here to talk about pre-settled and settled status. So okay. over to you Dimitri. Uh, I'll be brief and mainly I'll answer to the, to the question that I already have seen it. So uh, let's get started. First of all, as you know, we are in the transition period until the 31st of December 2020. This means that still there is freedom of movement, still any European citizen and family relatives can come to the UK without having to prove anything. Then we have time to apply for the EU Settlement Scheme up until the 30th June 2021. Okay, so this is how it was, and this is still the, the official deadline. So there is no extension. Lots of people are asking, oh, my, because of COVID-19 or coronavirus, it's gonna be an extension? No, so far there are no extensions. So you all have to apply at the latest by the 30th of June, 2021, and to enter the UK by the 31st December, 2020. Let's go into some questions. So someone asked, and Maurizio already replied, whether the universal credit application is gonna affect my application for settled status. Now, the EU settlement scheme that includes both the pre-settled status if you've been here for less than five years, and the settled status if you've been here for five years, it's based on residency. It's not based on work. So you can, you can live in the UK, you can have been in the UK for five years without working at all, and you can still apply for settled status. So the fact that you're claiming for some benefits is not gonna affect your application for the settlement scheme. What is important though, it's always your residency. And this is quite essential. When you get your pre-settlement scheme, whether you've been here for five, for four years, three years, two years, one year, three days, six days, the home office is gonna check only your last six months. So it's up to you to then count when you reach the five years. Because some people get confused, I wanna clarify this point. When you receive your pre-settled status, and let's say that today it's the, I don't know, 14th of May, I received my pre-settled status. The pre-settled status is valid for five years. So it means that if we are 14th of May, 2020, my settled status will be valid until 14th of May, 2025. Why? Because the government is allowing me, is giving me the five years that are necessary to accumulate this five-year residency. But if you have been here in the UK since April 2017, then in April 2022 is when you can apply for your settled status. And you will have to prove then your continuity of residence, meaning that you need to show to the government that you've been here in the UK for five years. If you've done the application for pre-settled status, you already know that it's an automatic check that goes through your national insurance number. Now, once you get pre-settled status, it's important that you don't interrupt your continuity of residency. What does it mean? It means that you shall not be away from the UK for more than 180 days per year, okay? That equals six months. These 180 days do not have to be continuous, okay? Now, another thing that often people ask, when is my year starting? Your year is not starting on the 1st of January or in September as an academic year. Your year starts from the moment you enter in the UK for the first time. So if you enter the UK in April, your year will go from April until March. So from April until March, it is essential that you're not abroad for more than 180 days. This is to clarify. 
Lots of questions about the COVID-19. Will the home office check my absence? Will it consider my absence determined by COVID-19 because lots of citizens are stranded and blocked in other countries as the lack of continuity of residency? I cannot answer yet to this question, but I can confirm that I had a meeting with the home office on the 1st of May, and obviously this question has been raised to the home office, and they have replied that they are due to release a guidelines about COVID-19 and not just the youth settlement scheme, but all the immigration laws related to that have been affected by COVID-19. They just said that they will be generous, but this is what they say. And until we don't see the official guidelines, I cannot confirm that the Home Office will not consider these months that we have been locked away from the UK as you know, they're going to affect your continuity of residence. So keep an eye through the institution because as soon as this is going to be uh, online on the government website, uh, it will, for sure it will be shared by the committees, it will be shared by the consulate to keep the citizens informed. So for now, we cannot say yes, the Home Office will not count this month, but they promise that it will be generous. So I assume that perhaps one or two months that we have been blocked away in other countries will be not counted and will not affect the six months of continued residency. Then I had another question about the code for settled status now. And people can work, I've been asked the code. Now, all the European citizens, repeat, I repeat what I said at the beginning. We enjoy the same rights as before the UK left the European Union. And we enjoy the same rights until the 31st of December. So if anyone is asking you a code to work, it's something that is not compulsory. So you, if you want, you can share it, but it's not compulsory for allowing you to work. So it's the, it's the responsibility of the employer to know this because until 31st of December, you have the right to apply for any job without proving your set of status and you have to write to work without having to show any set of status. And the same I think is for the renting houses, stuff like that. To verify and to get this famous code for set of status, I'm gonna send the link in the chat to all the attendees you have to, just give me one second, so all panelists and attendees, you have to go to this website, which is www.gov.uk, view and prove your immigration status. If you go there, you open this page, you will see that here you have to log in by inserting your passport details, the date of birth, and then you will be allowed into your page and you will see your set of status. And then by clicking to the bottom, it will generate this link that will be shared to an employer, whoever requests for this. Okay. If you have questions about this in the future, you can still contact the committee and I will answer to you. And an, an, an important issue for people, European citizens, they are married or have family relatives, they are non-European citizens. Now, if you are a non-EU citizen, but third country national, but you're married or you're closely related to an EU citizen, you can still apply for the EU settlement scheme and you will still enjoy the same rights and benefits, regardless of whether you are EU or not, okay? So to answer a question to Stefano that's been asking several questions about this. If your wife is non-EU but gets pre-settled status, she enjoys the same rights as you. And if uh, the NHS or wh wh whoever discriminates her, then is breaching the directive of the, its instructed individual agreement. So you enjoy the same rights. The issue that we're having at the moment is that if you are a non-EU citizen and you don't have a biometric residency card, then the Home Office, if you apply, will ask you to get the biometric um, fingerprints and all the details that they need. But because of the coronavirus crisis, everything is shut down. So the non-EU non citizens cannot apply now unless they have a biometric residency card because the Home Office has shut down their centers for the time being. And just at the beginning of this week, they finally reopened the EU Resolution Center which is the center where you can call if you have an issue with your application. So I remember that some of the questions that said, I've done the application, but we didn't receive any answer yet. So the way you can check is by going to the website that I, I, I 
placed in the participant chat. You can just log in and see. If your status is there, it will be there. If it's not there, it means they're still processing it. What you can do is you, you can go and call the EU Resolution Center to double check at what stage is your application. Also, due to the COVID-19 emergency, all the applications are being slowed down because all the employees of the home office did not have laptop at the workplace. So they had to wait until the home office provided these laptops to all the people that were working for the, for the applications. And this has slowed lots of applications. I passports. So if you're able to scan your passport, so if you're able to do an application and you're able to scan your passport, go ahead with it. If you have a paper ID, the lovely Italian papers ID that the UK hates so much, do not apply yet because the Home Office is not taking any document yet until they reopen the centers. So if you need to send your passport or your ID, I would suggest you wait until the centers are open and then apply for it. And then if someone can help me about the question. Yeah, Dimit Dimitri, there's a, there's a very simple question here from Laura uh, Leuzzi uh, asking if she already has um, pre-settled status, uh, how does she go about uh, transferring that into settled status? In other words, is it an automatic thing? No, 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 no. It, it, Does she have to start a new process, a new no, form? No. It's not automatic at all because, uh, as I said at the beginning, the settles, when you apply for pre settled status, it just checks six months and that's it. It doesn't check all the time that you've been in the UK. So when you know that you've reached five years of residence in the UK, you have to start a fresh application and it means that you will have to start everything from scratch. So, so as soon as you have been in the country for five years, you as transfer. As you can prove to... also that you've been here for five years. Okay, this yeah. is important because uh, we have experience. I've done now tons of application, and sometimes through the national insurance number it finds you, but sometimes it doesn't find you. So sometimes you will have to provide a proof of residence. Proof of residency it can be done by you know uh, bank statements, council tax bills, letters from the NHS, etc., etc. Okay. Other questions? Does my daughter need to be here because she will need it when I was, uh, My daughter has just finished five years holding in Glasgow. What is the next year? She really has to be and going to be eligible for such a thing. Yes, you need to reapply. Uh, anonymous attendee, you will have to reapply. Apply again for settled status. My advice is apply before she goes back to Italy. Okay. Do we have any more open questions? Uh... This, the last question is, it's like yeah, four questions for one. Yeah. <laughs> does, an, okay. does a non-EU citizen need a national insurance number to apply for pre-settled status? Yeah, Nicole, Nicola Fabian, you, I would advise that Nicola Fabian, I just sent my passport last week, so I couldn't scan it. What happens now? I know the signed for it. And call the EU Resolution Center. Okay. Call the EU Resolution Center. If you just Google EU Resolution Center, you have to... to they, you will inform them, then we'll, we'll yeah. let you know. And the last question, maybe there's someone who has settled status. Oh my God, uh, Stefano is asking tons of questions all after each other, not in one question. Does a non-EU need a need to apply for pre-settled status? No. Now, to apply settled status or for pre-settled status, you need to prove your residency. So the national insurance number helps, but it's not compulsory. So if you don't have national insurance number, you will have to provide the, your proof of residency but you can still apply. You don't need the national insurance number. It helps a lot because the automatic checks verify where you are being, but if not, you can still apply. If I have set a status, it can be for the UK for up to years without being affected. And I leave, stop my house contract to go back to Italy for a few months and then come back, does it affect my set of status? No, if you have set of status, you have the right to, you don't, you don't need to build any more continuity residency. And so you can leave the country for four days, 361 days, and then come back on the last day, and you will still allow back in the UK. Okay, I don't know if you can see, there's a question there from Federica, uh, which may actually be one that the consul would be able to answer better. Um, this is a question uh, in view of the COVID situation. What happens if the situation worsens next year in Italy, if the Italian or UK government uh, stops us reuniting with, uh, I think it's a daughter. Uh, she lives in the UK, will be in Italy for study. 
Uh, will there be special flights to Ital for Italians to come back and forward between the UK and Italy? What about access to hospitals and doctors? Um, I think it's a bit early stage to answer this question. <laughs> we, I mean, you cannot know what's going to happen next year. I don't know if the Council may want to ask this question. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it's not really possible at this stage to give any kind of information about that. Sorry, it's not okay. now. Okay, okay. Well, we, we're remarkably on time. We've got uh, five minutes left. So thanks everyone for taking part. Um, I just want to thank someone who we have not seen yet, and that is Carlo Pirozzi. Um, Carlo does an extraordinary amount of work. He is an academic at Edinburgh University and works for the... Uh, the comites um, tirelessly and he has done a lot behind the scenes to make today happen. So um, I promised we would be finished for half six, we're finished just a minute or two early so thanks again to everyone, to Mark, to Dimitri, to the Consul Fabio, to Davide Barnia and to Adriano De Marco from the comites. I think the uh, opportunity remains if people want to keep asking questions or keep looking at the, uh, the websites and so on that have been mentioned here. If you click uh, on the Q&A or on the Zoom webinar chat, you will see uh, that you can still uh, contact each other in that way. But for now, thank you very much for participating in the webinar and we'll see you again soon when other questions will come up and other questions will be answered. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.